The phone rang, shattering the peaceful quiet of our Saturday morning. I, Ethan, reached for it, a mug of coffee warming my hand, the scent of maple syrup and bacon filling our small kitchen. It was a jarring contrast to the voice on the other end, a clipped official tone that sent a shiver down my spine. This is an emergency broadcast. This is not a test. All residents of the town are ordered to evacuate immediately. Repeat, evacuate immediately. The voice, devoid of warmth or explanation, delivered the message with a chilling finality, then clicked off, leaving me staring at the phone, my heart pounding in my chest, a sense of unease settling over me like a shroud. I glanced at Maya, my wife. Her brow furrowed as she scanned a medical journal at the kitchen table, sunlight streaming through the window, illuminating the normalcy of our life, a life that was about to be irrevocably shattered. What was that about, Ethan? she asked, her voice a concerned murmur. Evacuation order, I replied, my voice a hollow echo of the broadcast's chilling tone. They said to leave immediately. Confusion warred with a growing sense of dread within me. Evacuation? Why? There were no storms brewing, no wildfires raging, no imminent threats that I knew of. The town, Nestled in a valley surrounded by dense forests and towering mountains was a place of peace and quiet, a haven from the chaos of the world beyond. We had moved here a year ago, seeking a simpler life, a refuge from the stress and noise of the city. And now, this. The phone rang again, this time a neighbor, her voice frantic, her words tumbling over each other in a torrent of fear and confusion. Ethan, have you heard? There... They're evacuating the town. They're saying it's, it's not safe, but they won't tell us why. Her voice cracked, a sob escaping her lips. Then the line went dead. The phone continued to ring, a chorus of panicked voices, each call a confirmation of the unsettling truth. The town was being evacuated, and no one knew why. Maya, her medical instincts kicking in, her voice now calm and firm said, We need to pack a bag, Ethan. Grab essentials, medications, documents, warm clothes. Something's wrong, something's happening. I nodded, her words a grounding force in the growing chaos. We moved through the house with a practiced efficiency, gathering essentials, our movements automatic, our minds racing, our hearts pounding with a mixture of fear and a desperate need to understand. As we loaded our bags into the car, the streets outside were a symphony of honking horns and screeching tires, a frantic exodus fueled by fear and uncertainty. Military vehicles, their green paint gleaming in the sunlight, their presence a jarring intrusion into the town's usual tranquility, rumbled through the streets, their loudspeakers blaring the evacuation order, their soldiers' faces grim, their eyes scanning the fleeing townsfolk with a chilling intensity. This doesn't make sense, Ethan. Maya said, her voice a hushed whisper as we watched a convoy of military trucks rumble past, their canvas covers concealing their cargo, their destination unknown. Why the military? Why the secrecy? What are they hiding from us? I didn't have an answer. But as I glanced towards the outskirts of town, towards the research facility nestled in the foothills, its buildings a cluster of low-slung structures surrounded by high fences and barbed wire, a facility so secretive that even its name remained a mystery, a chilling premonition, a whisper of a truth I couldn't yet comprehend, settled upon me. The evacuation, the military presence, the whispers of something sinister, it was all connected. And I, Ethan, the software engineer, the man who had sought a simple life, a refuge from the world's chaos, was now about to be thrust into the heart of a nightmare. The evacuation order, a desperate attempt at containment, a last-ditch effort to protect the world from a darkness that had been unleashed, was not meant to save us. It was meant to contain us. The engine of our old Subaru sputtered, its headlights cutting through the thickening dusk, as we joined the exodus of cars fleeing the town. The road, usually quiet, was a snarled serpent of headlights and taillights, the air thick with the stench of exhaust and the rising panic that seemed to spread like a virus. It doesn't make sense, Ethan, Maya said, her voice tight with worry. 
Why evacuate the entire town? There's no natural disaster, no warning. It's like they're running from something. Her words, echoing my own unease, ignited a spark of defiance within me. I couldn't just blindly follow orders, flee into the unknown without understanding the threat, the reason for this sudden chaotic evacuation. I glanced at the research facility on the outskirts of town, its silhouette a dark smudge against the darkening sky, a beacon of secrecy in a world that was suddenly unraveling. My instincts, honed by years of analyzing code, of searching for patterns, of debugging complex systems, screamed at me that the answers, the truth behind this evacuation, lay within those guarded walls. We need to know what's going on, Maya, I said, my voice firm, though my heart hammered in my chest, a frantic counterpoint to the logical part of my brain that urged me to follow the flow of traffic, to escape the town while we still could. Maya, ever the pragmatist, a doctor who had faced her share of emergencies, her calm demeanor a reassuring presence in the face of the growing chaos, hesitated. But Ethan, the evacuation order. It's not for our safety, I said, my gaze fixed on the research facility, its presence a growing shadow in the gathering darkness. It's to contain something, something they don't want us to know about. I pulled the car off the road, onto a narrow dirt track that led towards the facility, its entrance guarded by a pair of military checkpoints, their flashing red lights a warning, a challenge. What are you doing, Ethan? Maya asked, her voice a mix of fear and excitement. I'm going to find out the truth, I replied, my gaze fixed on the checkpoints, my mind already calculating our approach, my heart pounding with a mixture of fear and a journalist's insatiable hunger for a story. We bypassed the first checkpoint, taking a detour through a farmer's field, the headlights bouncing across the uneven terrain, the engines sputtering in protest. We're trespassing, Ethan, Maya said, her voice a hushed whisper. This is dangerous. We're already in danger, Maya, I replied, my gaze fixed on the second checkpoint, its floodlights illuminating the deserted road, its guards, their silhouettes stark against the light, their weapons a chilling reminder of the stakes. We just don't know it yet. We approached the checkpoint slowly, my heart pounding in my chest, the headlights illuminating the guards' faces, their expressions grim, their eyes hardened by a knowledge, a fear, that mirrored our own. Turn around, the guard barked, his voice amplified by a loudspeaker, its echo a jarring intrusion into the night stillness. This is a restricted area. Evacuation order is in effect. Turn around, or face the consequences. But I couldn't turn back. The truth, the answers we sought, lay beyond that checkpoint, within the walls of the research facility. And I, Ethan, the software engineer, the man who had always believed in logic and reason, was now driven by a primal instinct, a need to understand, to survive, to protect the woman I loved from a darkness I could only glimpse. I pressed down on the gas pedal, the engine roaring, the tires spinning, the car surging forward, breaking through the checkpoint, the guard's shouts fading behind us, swallowed by the night. We were entering a world of shadows and whispers, a realm of secrets and lies, a place where the boundaries between reality and nightmare blurred. And I, Ethan, the man who had sought a simpler life, a refuge from the chaos, was now a fugitive, a hunter of truths, a prisoner of a mystery that threatened to consume us all. The research facility loomed before us, its silhouette a dark monolith against the starless night sky. The headlights of the Subaru cut through the darkness, illuminating a chain-link fence topped with razor wire, a guard tower manned by a lone soldier, his rifle glinting in the pale moonlight. My heart pounded against my ribs, a frantic rhythm that mirrored the urgency of our situation. We were fugitives now, trespassers on forbidden ground, our curiosity leading us deeper into a mystery that felt increasingly dangerous, increasingly real. We can't go any further, Ethan, Maya whispered, her voice tight with fear. They'll shoot us. But I couldn't turn back. Not now. Not when we were so close to the truth. There's a service entrance around back, I said, my gaze scanning the facility's perimeter, my mind replaying a satellite image of the compound I downloaded earlier that day a map of potential access points, 
Escape Routes, a blueprint for navigating the unknown. We abandoned the Subaru, its engine sputtering to a halt, its headlights fading, and crept along the fence line, the whispers of the wind a chilling counterpoint to our own hushed breaths. The service entrance, a heavy metal door set into the concrete wall, was locked, but the security camera monitoring it, its lens shattered, its wiring severed, hung limply, a silent testament to the chaos that had gripped the town, the breakdown of order, the unraveling of the carefully constructed facade of normalcy. I pulled out a set of lockpicks, their metal cool against my palm, a familiar comfort in the face of the unknown. The lock, a standard military issue, yielded with a satisfying click, the door groaning open, its sound a jarring intrusion into the night's stillness. We slipped inside, the facility's sterile, air-conditioned air a stark contrast to the damp chill of the night, the scent of disinfectant and ozone replacing the metallic tang that had clung to us since our arrival in the town. But the silence, the oppressive stillness that hung in the air, was even more unsettling. It was the silence of a place holding its breath, a silence that whispered of secrets, of experiments, of a darkness that lurked beneath the surface. We navigated the corridors, guided by a combination of instinct, my memory of the satellite images, and a growing sense of unease that seemed to emanate from the very walls of the facility. We passed laboratories filled with equipment that hummed and pulsed, their purpose unknown, their presence unsettling. We glimpsed figures in lab coats, their faces pale, their eyes shadowed with a weariness that spoke of sleepless nights, their movements quick and nervous, as if they were racing against time, against a deadline they couldn't escape. And everywhere the whispers, a chorus of voices that seemed to seep from the ventilation system, from the flickering fluorescent lights, from the very air we breathed, their murmurs a chilling counterpoint to the sterile hum of the facility. He's here. He's watching. He's hungry. We reached a heavy steel door, its surface emblazoned with a biohazard warning symbol and a cryptic code that defied my attempts at decryption. This is it, Ethan, Maya whispered, her voice a mix of fear and determination. Dr. Whitlock's lab. I nodded, my hand reaching for the doorknob, its cold metal sending a shiver down my spine. The whispers intensified, their voices swirling around us, their tone a mixture of warning and a strange, seductive allure. The truth awaits, but beware. The hunger, it consumes all. I pushed the door open and we stepped into the lab, the air thick with the metallic tang, the whispers echoing around us, the darkness closing in. And there, in the center of the lab, illuminated by a single flickering light, stood a figure, tall and imposing, his face shadowed, his eyes burning with a cold, calculating light. Dr. Whitlock. His gaze fixed on us, a chilling smile spreading across his face, a smile that revealed a glimpse of sharp white teeth. Welcome, he whispered, his voice a low melodic murmur that seemed to resonate with the whispers, a discordant harmony in the symphony of dread that had enveloped our world. I've been expecting you. Dr. Whitlock stood before us, a figure of chilling composure amidst the chaos of the deserted lab. The air crackled with a strange energy, the metallic tang thick and cloying, the whispers swirling around us like a chorus of unseen observers. Curious, isn't it? Whitlock's voice, a low, melodic murmur, cut through the silence. The way fear can taint even the most sterile environment. He gestured towards a steel table in the center of the lab, where a large glass cylinder filled with a pulsating iridescent liquid dominated the space. Wires and tubes snaked out from the cylinder, connecting it to an array of monitors that displayed complex waveforms and cryptic symbols. Project Chimera, he said, his smile widening, his eyes gleaming with a disturbing fascination. My life's work, Nathaniel's unfinished symphony. He glanced at Maya, his gaze lingering on her doctor's coat, a predatory gleam in his eyes. You're a medical professional, Dr. Maya, he said, his voice a seductive purr. You understand the complexities of the human body, 
the fragility of life, the yearning for something more. Maya, her face pale, but her gaze steady, her medical instincts battling against the fear that threatened to consume her, said, What is that, Dr. Whitlock? What are you doing here? We're pushing the boundaries of science, Dr. Maya, Whitlock replied, his voice a chillingly calm lecture. We're exploring the frontiers of human potential. We're seeking to transcend the limitations of mortality. He gestured towards the cylinder, its contents pulsing, its energy radiating outwards, warping the air around it, a visual representation of the whispers that now pounded against my skull. The entity, he whispered, his voice a reverent hush, a being of pure energy, a conduit to another realm, a source of unimaginable power. What have you done, Whitlock? I asked, my voice a low growl, my hand tightening on the digital recorder in my pocket, capturing his every word, a testament to his madness, to the depths of depravity that human ambition could reach. I've done what Nathaniel failed to do, he replied, his smile widening, a flicker of triumph in his eyes. I've contained it. I've harnessed its power. And soon, I will become its master. He stepped closer to the cylinder, his gaze fixed on its pulsating contents, his fingers tracing the cryptic symbols etched into its glass surface. The convergence is near, he whispered, his voice a low hum that seemed to resonate with the whispers, with the entity's growing power. The veil between worlds is thinning, and I, I will be ready. He turned towards us, his eyes burning with a fanaticism that chilled me to the bone. Join me, he urged, his voice a seductive caress. Embrace the power, transcend your mortality, become more than human. His words, a siren song of temptation, echoed in the lab's sterile silence. But I, Leo, the journalist who had sought the truth, now saw the darkness, the madness, that consumed Whitlock, his mind twisted by the artifact's influence, his soul a prisoner of his own ambition. I glanced at Maya, her face pale, her eyes wide with fear, yet a flicker of defiance burning within them. We had stumbled upon a truth far more terrifying than we could have ever imagined. And we were trapped, caught in a web of secrets and lies, hunted by a creature born from the depths of human folly, a creature that fed on our fear, a creature that Dr. Whitlock, in his madness, sought to control. We had to escape. We had to warn the world. We had to stop him before it was too late. Run, I hissed, grabbing Maya's hand, pulling her away from the pulsating cylinder, from the chilling intensity of Dr. Whitlock's gaze. His words, his crazed obsession with immortality, the palpable sense of dread that radiated from the artifact confirmed our worst fears. We were trapped in a nightmare, a web of twisted science and unleashed darkness. We sprinted towards the lab's exit, adrenaline surging through our veins, our breaths ragged, our footsteps echoing in the sterile silence. But even as we ran, the lab's environment shifted, the fluorescent lights flickering, casting grotesque shadows that danced and writhed on the walls, the metallic tang intensifying, a suffocating presence that filled our lungs a taste of fear and decay. The door, once a simple steel barrier, now seemed to pulse with the artifact's energy, its surface warping, its handle twisting into a grotesque, organic shape that seemed to mock our escape. It's... it's locked! Maya gasped, her voice trembling, her fingers fumbling with the now unfamiliar door handle. Stand back, I said, my voice a strained whisper, Though my own heart hammered against my ribs, a frantic drumbeat against the whispers that now screamed within my skull. He's angry. He's hungry. He's coming. I slammed my shoulder against the door again and again, the metal groaning in protest, but the lock held firm. We were trapped. And then, behind us, a low growl, a guttural rasp that seemed to emanate from the very walls, shattered the silence. The entity. We spun around our flashlights cutting through the lab's shifting darkness, their beams illuminating a figure that stood in the doorway, its form a grotesque fusion of shadow and flesh, its eyes burning with a cold blue fire. It was vaguely humanoid, yet its limbs were elongated, twisted, its skin a patchwork of mottled gray and sickly green, 
its mouth a gaping maw filled with razor-sharp teeth. The whispers, a cacophony of screams and snarls, seemed to emanate from the creature itself, its presence a palpable wave of terror that washed over us, draining our strength, our hope. He's here, Maya whispered, her voice barely audible above the creature's growls, her hand reaching for the small surgical knife she always carried in her pocket, a meager defense against the unimaginable. We're not going to make it, are we? But even as despair threatened to consume us, a glint of metal, a flash of movement in the shadows behind the creature, offered a flicker of hope. A figure, tall and imposing, emerged from the darkness, its silhouette familiar, yet chillingly distorted in the lab's shifting light. It held a rifle, its barrel gleaming, its aim steady. Get down, the figure barked, its voice a gruff command that cut through the creature's growls, the whispers, the chaos. A shot rang out, the sound deafening in the confined space, the smell of gunpowder filling the air. The creature shrieked, a sound that seemed to tear through the very fabric of reality, its shadowy form reeling back from the force of the impact. And then, I saw his face. Alex, a former military officer, a man I'd known during my own brief stint in the army, a man whose life had been shattered by Dr. Whitlock's experiments, his body scarred, his mind haunted by the darkness he had encountered. Alex? I gasped, disbelief warring with a surge of relief. What? What are you doing here? Saving your asses, he growled, his voice a low rumble, his gaze fixed on the creature, which was now circling us, its form flickering, its eyes burning with a renewed intensity. Whitlock, he used me, just like he used all the others, he said his voice laced with a cold fury. But I survived, and I'm here, to make him pay. The lab's air crackled with tension, the metallic tang thick and cloying, mingling with the acrid smell of gunpowder. The creature, its shadowy form flickering and shifting, paced before us, its blue eyes narrowed, its growls a guttural rasp that echoed our own racing heartbeats. I don't trust him, Ethan, Maya whispered, her gaze fixed on Alex his silhouette stark against the flickering emergency lights, his rifle held tight, his stance a soldier's, his face a mask of grim determination. We don't have much choice, Maya, I replied, my voice a low murmur, my own instincts screaming at me to question Alex's motives, his sudden appearance, the knowledge that flickered in his haunted eyes. We're trapped, and that thing, it's not going to stop hunting us. Alex, as if sensing our doubt, his voice a gruff growl that cut through the whispers said, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to stop Whitlock. He's the one who unleashed this nightmare upon the world. And he's the one who needs to be stopped. He gestured toward a narrow corridor that branched off from the lab, its darkness beckoning, its silence unsettling. There's a way out, he said, his voice low, urgent. A secret passage. Whitlock used it to move, specimens, between labs. It leads to the old maintenance tunnels. From there we can reach the surface. His words, spoken with a conviction that resonated with a soldier's authority, a survivor's desperation, offered a glimmer of hope. But the metallic tang in the air intensified, the creature's growls echoing closer, a chilling reminder of the danger that lurked, a darkness that fed on our fear, a hunger that wouldn't be denied. We have to trust him, Maya, I whispered, my gaze meeting hers, a silent plea for understanding, a shared acceptance of the desperate gamble we were about to take. We followed Alex into the corridor, its darkness swallowing us whole, the emergency lights flickering behind us, their feeble glow unable to penetrate the oppressive gloom. The air grew colder, the metallic scent so strong it made my eyes water. The whispers a cacophony of screams and snarls that clawed at the edges of our sanity. The creature's howls echoed through the tunnels, its pursuit relentless, its presence a suffocating weight that pressed down on us. We stumbled through the darkness, our flashlights casting long, distorted shadows that danced and writhed, transforming the corridor's familiar contours into a nightmarish labyrinth. The floor beneath our feet vibrated with the creature's approach, 
its rhythmic thudding a heartbeat of dread that echoed our own racing pulses. And then, just ahead, a faint glimmer of light, a pinprick of hope against the encroaching darkness, appeared. Almost there, Alex whispered, his voice a gruff reassurance, his flashlight beam revealing a heavy steel door, its surface unmarked, its presence a stark anomaly in the rough-hewn stone walls of the passage. This is it, the entrance to the maintenance tunnels. He pressed his hand against the door, a series of clicks echoing as he deactivated a hidden lock, a secret mechanism known only to those who had served in the shadows of Labrina compound. The door creaked open, revealing a narrow, descending staircase, its metal steps rusted and slick with moisture, its darkness beckoning, a path to freedom or a descent into a deeper circle of hell. We hesitated, the whispers intensifying, their voices a chorus of warning and a strange, mournful lament. But behind us, the creature's howls, louder now, more insistent, fueled our desperation, our need to escape this nightmare, to survive. We plunged into the darkness, the steel door clanging shut behind us, its echo a finality that sealed our fate. We were on our own now, trapped in a labyrinth of secrets and lies, hunted by a creature born from the depths of human folly, our only hope a fading glimmer of light at the end of a treacherous unknown path. The metal steps groaned beneath our weight, each clang a jarring echo in the oppressive silence of the maintenance tunnels. The air hung heavy, thick with the stench of rust and decay, the metallic tang amplified, a taste of fear that lingered on my tongue. We descended deeper into the heart of the facility, our flashlight beams cutting through the gloom, revealing a labyrinth of pipes and wires, a network of forgotten pathways that whispered of secrets, of experiments, of a darkness that had seeped into the very foundation of Labrina compound. Alex, his rifle held tight, his movements a soldier's instinct, led the way, his gaze scanning the shadows, his jaw clenched, his face etched with a grim determination. Stay close, he muttered, his voice a low rumble. These tunnels, they're not safe. Not anymore. I could feel the creature's presence, a palpable weight that pressed down on us, the whispers intensifying, their voices a cacophony of screams and snarls, a symphony of dread that echoed through the tunnels, a constant reminder of the danger that lurked behind us. He's coming. He can smell your fear. He won't stop. Until he has you. We reached a junction, a crossroads in the labyrinth, where the tunnels branched off in a confusing array of paths, their darkness beckoning, their silence a threat. Which way, Alex? Maya asked, her voice a strained whisper. Alex hesitated, his gaze sweeping the tunnels, his brow furrowed, a flicker of doubt in his eyes. I... I don't remember, he said, his voice a low growl. The layout, it's changed. It's like the whole place is... shifting. His words, a chilling confirmation of the artifact's power, its ability to warp space, to twist perception, to unravel the fabric of reality itself, sent a wave of icy fear through me. We were trapped in a labyrinth of madness, a prison of our own making, hunted by a creature born from the depths of human ambition, a monster that fed on our fear, a darkness that threatened to consume us all. And then, from the depths of the tunnels, a sound, a chilling melody that seemed to echo the whispers, a song of sorrow and despair drifted towards us, its notes a siren's call, a lure towards oblivion. Do you hear that? Maya whispered, her voice a tremor in the silence. That music? We strained to listen, the melody growing louder, closer, its haunting tune weaving a spell of dread around our hearts. It's... It's beautiful, Alex muttered, his gaze distant, his voice a hollow echo, his words a chilling reminder of the artifact's seductive power, its ability to twist our perceptions, to blur the lines between beauty and horror. I pulled James's journal from my pocket, its worn leather cover cold against my palm, its pages filled with a faded, spidery handwriting, its whispers a faint hum that resonated with the song echoing through the tunnels. 
As I flipped through the pages, a passage, underlined with a shaky hand, leaped out at me, its words a chilling revelation, a key to understanding the nightmare that surrounded us. The creature, it lures its prey with a song, a melody of despair, a symphony of the damned. James had warned of this, of the Wendigo's seductive power, its ability to mimic the voices of loved ones, to weave a tapestry of sound that would lull its victims into a trance, a state of hypnotic surrender. Alex, we have to cover our ears, I shouted, my voice urgent, a desperate plea against the hypnotic power of the melody, its haunting notes already seeping into my mind, weaving a tapestry of despair, a longing for oblivion. But Alex, his gaze fixed on the tunnel from which the song emanated, his body swaying slightly, his lips moving as if singing along to the creature's mournful tune, shook his head. No, he whispered, his voice a distant echo, his eyes glazed with a hypnotic trance. It's... it's beautiful. It understands. The pain. The sorrow. It's calling to me. Promising. Peace. He stumbled towards the source of the music, his rifle clattering to the floor, his footsteps echoing in the silence, a soldier marching towards his doom, a lost soul lured by the siren song of the Wendigo. Alex, no! Maya cried out, her voice a desperate plea. But her words were lost in the symphony of dread, swallowed by the creature's mournful song, its melody weaving a spell of oblivion, a tapestry of darkness that promised to consume us all. We were trapped, our sanity unraveling, our minds besieged by the whispers, our bodies succumbing to the creature's hypnotic call. And as the darkness closed in, the metallic tang filling my lungs, the taste of fear bitter on my tongue, I knew, with a chilling certainty, that there would be no escape from the Silver's End mine, that the hunger within its depths would claim us all.